하나, 둘, 셋 시작하겠습니다. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have no idea how many people are on on online now. Uh, this session is 4K video session, and we have four uh, speakers now. The first uh, speaker is Park Sun Chan, uh, Park Sun Song Chan from uh, Korea. Uh, he will talk about uh, TATME, Trans Anal Total Mesorectal Excision. And the second speaker is uh, Dr. Shiraki Yoshi, who, who is very famous of uh, corrector surgeon in Japan, working in a uh, cancer institute hospital in Japan. He will talk about a particular type of dissection. This video is about transanal TME in the patient with rectal cancer after preoperative CRT. Because of low line Q And the third speaker is Horatio uh, Aspon. He will talk, he will give us a video about pancreatic surgery. And the fourth uh, speaker is Andrea. He will give us a talk, an anastomotic technique for asperger cancer. Okay, let's start the video. This video is about transanal TME in the patient with rectal cancer after preoperative CRT. Because of low line tumor, we made a first string suture before initiation of transanal dissection. Secure pulse string suture is very important and it must be durable and airtight to avoid contamination and tumor cell spillage during the procedure. During transanal intersphincteric dissection, we follow the layer between outer circular muscle and inner longitudinal muscle. When we reach the proximal end of puborectal recess link, we can identify the very distal end of the mesorectum. Careful bottom-up dissection should be continued to the holy plane. Posterior and anterior planes are easier to identify than the laterals. We usually find the correct dissection plane posteriorly first and then identify the prostate or vaginal wall anteriorly. We recommend to dissect the lateral planes by completing the imaginary line of dissected anterior and posterior planes.
We can clearly identify the sacral nerve fibers because transcendental TME provides us very good visualization of pelvic anatomy. We should be careful not to go into the deep plane. During transcendental dissection, presacral venous plexus is very easy to be injured. So, it is important to proceed slowly, making sure that the vessels is not exposed. When the tumor level is very low and located anteriorly, we should identify the rectourethralis muscle. If the anterior dissection plane is too close to the urethral sphincter muscle, we can damage the urethra. Urethral injury during transanal TME happens in 1% of patients, and this complication could result in open conversion and persistent urinary dysfunction. In severe cases, we cannot avoid permanent urinary diversion. In the difficult cases, direct palpation of folic catheter or use of fluorescence dye is recommended to avoid urethral injury. Landmark of anterior dissection in male patient is prostate and vagina wall in female patient. Because of magnified straightforward view from trace anal approach, all fine dissection of anterior side is possible. If there is suspicion of direct invasion to the prostate, we can secure more circumferential resection margin by partial resection of prostate. Because there are abundant periprostatic and paravaginal sinuses, we can confront a venous bleeding during anterior wall dissection. But this kind of venous bleeding can be obscured because of high CO2 pressure in the narrow pelvis. In this situation, large amount of CO2 gas can flow into the vein, resulting in CO2 embolism. When there is bleeding, during the anterior wall dissection, intermittent desuffination 
of new pelvis is helpful to prevent this serious complication. The tumor of this patient was located anteriorly and closely abutting to the prostate. So, we needed very slow and careful dissection, checking the circumferential resection margin. After surgery, the pathological examination showed YPT3 and 0 state with clear circumferential resection margin. When we proceed dissection anteriorly, we can reach to the peritoneal reflection and go into the peritoneal cavity. After we widen the opening of peritoneum, the two teams continue working together until the rectum and sigmoid are completely free. During dissection of anterolateral side of pelvis, we should be careful not to injure the neurovascular bundles. Working with abdominal team, we can easily communicate the posterior dissection plane. Tissue exposure during dissection is better achieved by pushing the specimen into the abdominal cavity. Because 
We have done some conferential dissection. It is easy to remove the remnant tissue and attachment around the rectum. This is the final view from anus after completion of TME. We can clearly see the prostate. From abdominal view, we can see that total medirectal excision was completed clearly. It's a great honor for me to have a presentation in this session today. I'd like to talk about laparoscopic lateral infant dissection for advanced rectal cancer. I have a honoraria from Johnson & Johnson. In Western countries, lateral pelvic lymphoma metastasis is generally considered a metastatic disease that is not amenable to surgical cure, and surgeons do not perform lateral lymphoma dissection, LPLD, because preoperative CRT without extended surgery can provide acceptable, lo acceptable local control. There is no solid evidence to support the necessity of LPLD, especially after preoperative CRT for advanced rectal cancer. According to the Japanese guidelines, LPLD is recommended when the lower border of the tumor is located to distal to the peritoneal reflection and the depth of tumor is beyond T3. LPLD is strongly recommended when lateral lymphoma metastasis is suspected preoperatively or intraoperatively. When preoperative or intraoperative diagnosis of lateral lymphoma metastasis was negative, LPLD is weakly recommended because improvement of local control can be expected based on the result of Jacob Delta 1 trial. This is so called prophylactic LPLD. However, Japanese two high volume center, National Cancer Center and the Aichi Cancer Center, have reported that the local recurrence rate of patients with lateral lymphoma metastasis was over 20% and the five-year overall survival was around 50%. Therefore, patients with lateral lymphoma metastasis is at high risk of local recurrence even by lateral lymphoma dissection if neoadjuvant CRT is not performed. Then, how about the necessity of LPLD after CRT? In patients without enlarged lateral lymphoma, TME is enough because GRT can eradicate micrometastasis in lateral lymphoma. In patients with enlarged lateral lymphoma, Recent growing evidence suggests that lateral lymphoma metastasis is a major cause of local recurrence in patients with low rectal cancer with enlarged lateral lymphoma after CRT. We have reported that neoadjuvant CRT and selective LPLD can provide excellent oncological outcomes in patients with lateral lymphoma metastasis. So our treatment strategy for lateral lymphoma is that when preoperative imaging before CRT showed swollen lateral lymphoma measuring 7 mm or larger in the long axis diameter, we perform LPLD regardless of the size of lateral lymphoma after CRT on imaging. When no swollen lateral lymphoma are detected on imaging, we don't perform LPLD. Between 2004 and 2015, 460 consecutive patients with clinical stage 2-3 low rectal cancer below the peritoneal reflection were treated with preoperative CRT or RT. The median tumor distance from the inner verge was 40 mm, and the neoadjuvant system chemotherapy was performed in 19% of the patient, and the laparoscopic surgery was performed in 92% of the patient, and there were no conversion to open surgery. The lateral lymphoma dissection was performed in 33% of the patient, and the pathological lateral lymphoma metastasis was identified in 44 patients. 
The operation time was significantly longer and the total blood loss was significantly larger in the LPLD group compared to the TME group. The major complication rate tended to be higher in the LPLD group compared to the TME group, although it didn't reach statistical significance. The long-term outcomes of the entire cohort was acceptable with five-year local recurrence rate of 4.9%. This slide shows the long-term outcomes according to the YPM status. Disease-free survival of patients with lateral lymphoma metastasis was slightly better than that of mesorectal N1 and significantly better than mesorectal N2. The five-year local recurrence rate of patients with lateral lymphoma metastasis was only 2.3%, and this was slightly better than mesorectal N1 and significantly better than mesorectal N2. These results suggest that lateral lymphoma metastasis after CRT and LPLD is not a proper prognostic factor compared to the mesorectal lymphoma metastasis. Preoperative CRT might be effective to improve local control in patients with lateral lymphoma metastasis. I'd like to show the focus video. This case was 49-year-old male with advanced lymphoma cancer. This patient had swollen, light, common radiac lymph node and obturated lymph node. After six courses of forfoxy and CRT, the lateral lymph node decreased in size but remained. We performed laparoscopic APR and light lateral lymph node dissection. And the pathological examination showed two uh, residual cancer cells in common radiac and obturated lymph nodes. So the first step is to isolate the ureter. The dissection is performed along with the pre-hypogastric nerve fascia. Here we can see the ureter. So the next step is to expose the external iliac artery and vein. So this is X and iliac vein. So the cranial border of LPLD is uh, so usually the bifurcation of the external iliac artery and the internal iliac artery here. So the next step is expose the uh, major source muscle and the internal obturator mu muscle. Here we can see the major source muscle. The dissection is performed just medial side of the ob uh, external iliac vein. So here we can see the major source muscle and internal obturator muscle. The dissection is performed just along with these muscles. So next step is uh, dissection outside the so umbilical artery. Here we can see the umbilical artery and we can see small superior vesicular artery. In this case, this artery was preserved. So the dissection outside the umbilical artery is performed just along with the so-called vesicohypogastric nerve fascia. So we can see uh, very loose connective tissue and there is no major blood vessel so we can so easily dissect. So when we use this uh, so fascia as the landmark. So this movement is uh, so occurring by the stimulation of the obturator nerve.
here by the electoral coterie. So we can see the distal side of the obturator nerve. So this is internal obturator muscle. So this is bladder. So here we can see the tentinous arc of the levetina muscle. This is the bottom of the lateral lymphon dissection. So the distal side of the obturator vessels were divided here. So this is the proximal side. We can see here the external iliac vein. Now I'm trying to expose the surface of the internal iliac vein. And I'm looking for the proximal side of the obturator nerve. So taking care the sudden movement of the leg due to the stimulation of the uh, obturator nerve. Here I got the proximal side of the obturator nerve. The obturator nerve was dissected and preserved. So this is the medial side of the internal iliac vein. And this is the prehypogastric nerve fascia. The medial side of the internal iliac vein was exposed. So here I cut the so this hypogastric nerve fascia and I preserve the superior vesicular artery. And the proximal side of the obturator vein was divided. And the distal side of the inferior vesicular artery was exposed and clipped and divided, just along with the bladder. So another inferior vesicular artery and vein was divided. And next step we is uh, to divide the proximal side of the inferior vesicular vessels. In this case, uh, the swollen lateral infant was not close to the main trunk of the internal iliac artery and vein, so I preserved the main trunk of the internal iliac artery and vein, and only the branch was divided. This is a final proximal side of the uh, inferior vesicular vein. And the obturator lymph node and internal iliac lymph node were dissected down block. This is a view after dissection. This is bladder, umbilical artery, 
and internal area vein and artery internal obturator muscle so this patient uh, had swollen common iliac limb front this is a relatively rare but now i'm uh, dissecting the common iliac limb front this is common iliac artery and this is the inferior vena cava And this is psoas muscle. So the di dissection of the common iliac lymph node is performed only when uh, the preoperative pre imaging showed the suspected common iliac lymph node metastasis. But it's very rare. So this is psoas muscle. The dissection is performed just along the surface of the psoas muscle and uh, inferior vena cover. So actually, this patient had pathologically positive common iliac lymph node metastasis. So I think this dissection was meaningful in this patient. So this is the final view after the dissection. The patient is a 52-year-old male with a history of a recurrent ampullary adenoma. He had undergone an endoscopic mucosal resection and now presented with a recurrent lesion and high-grade dysplasia on a biopsy. An MRI of the abdomen demonstrates dilatation of the pancreatic and biliary ducts. The procedure is started by splitting the omentum longitudinally for the future postpalory duodenal jejunostomy. Then the lesser sac is entered and the gastrocolic omentum is divided from left to right up to the area of the truncum henle. At this level, the vessels of the truncum henle are surrounded in 360 degrees and staple and divided in block. The duodenum is then lifted anteriorly and a window is created on the first portion of the duodenum distal to the pylorus. A stapler is placed and two to three centimeters of duodenum distal to the pylorus are maintained. Attention is now paid to the gastrohepatic ligament, the hepatic artery lymph node, 8A, is excised and sent for frozen pathology examination. This exposes the hepatic artery and the origin of the gastroduodenal artery. The gastroduodenal artery is surrounded in 360 degrees, stapled and divided. Attention is now paid to the common bile duct. Superficial layers are divided. The duct is pulled laterally. Small bites are taken to avoid injuring the portal vein. The goal is to create a window around the common bile duct and after dividing the superficial layers, a finger type retractor is quite useful to surround the duct in 360 degrees. A bulldog is placed. Using scissors, the bile duct is opened and divided. The posterior layer is left three to four millimeters longer, which will facilitate the reconstruction. The distal stump is clipped. Attention is now paid to the inferior edge of the pancreas at the level of the superior mesenteric vein. A wide window will facilitate the identification of the superior mesenteric portal vein trunk below the edge of the pancreas. The finger retractor 
aids in passing a penrose, which will facilitate retraction of the pancreas to identify the first branches at the level of the groove between the uncinate process and the mesentery of the trophonary colon. The pancreatic parenchyma is now divided. Ultrasonic shears are used, accomplishing good hemostasis of the pancreatic arcades. Then, by using the free limb of the ultrasonic shears, the pancreatic duct will be identified independently. The pancreatic duct is now divided with scissors. A wide cocker maneuver is performed. The ligament of trites will be approached from the right. The dissection is done under direct visualization and the 4K technology allows us to clearly see the different layers. The ligament of trites is open. The jejunum is brought behind the supermesenteric vessels and a window is created at a site chosen for division of the jejunum. The proximal divided end is now freed from its mesentery which is ligated and divided. Larger vessels are clipped. Attention is going to be now paid to the area of the uncinate process. The uncinate process and head of the pancreas are retracted laterally. And now endocyanin green assists in the dissection by allowing for a better identification of the pancreatic parenchyma away from the vessels. Adequate timing for lighting up of the pancreas is important when given the endocyanin green. Larger venous branches from the superior mesenteric portal vein are clipped, but the majority of the dissection is done with a bipolar device. The PD artery is now identified and to confirm, endocyanin green allows us to see the blood flow. This is artery is clipped and the dissection is continued under direct visualization from cauda to cephalid. Again, a combination of endocyanin green and 4K high definition it's extremely helpful during this dissection. The last venous branch is clipped. The dissection is continued in an extension of the uncinate process towards the left behind the superior mesenteric portal vein trunk. One more time, the minimum base of access plus the high quality visualization allows for good exposure and reach to this area. Lymph nodes are exposed, excised, including it towards the sides of the specimen. The superior mesenteric portal vein trunk is skeletonized, assuring an M block resection. Final attachments of the specimen are ligated and divided. Once freed, the specimen will be sent for frozen pathology examination. Endocyanin in green lights up the liver. The superior mesenteric portal vein trunk and the cava are evident. The specimen is placed in an endoscopic retrieval bag and removed from the abdominal cavity through an enlarged port site. The reconstruction is now performed starting with the hepatico jejunostomy. A running suture in two layers is performed in the usual fashion. Here, the anastomosis is completed. The bulldog is removed.
a pancreatic or jejunostomy in two layers is done. The posterior layer has been constructed and now a duct to mucosa anastomosis is being built. A stent on the pancreatic duct is used only to facilitate stitching at the duct to mucosa anastomosis, but then will be removed. Each stitch is placed under direct visualization, assuring a watertight closure. An anterior seromuscular layer with a running monofilament suture completes the pancreatic ostomy. The gastrointestinal tract is not shown here and is done through a post-paloric duty in a jejunostomy. We will now show a left subtotal pancreatectomy also performed with 4K technology. The patient is a 63-year-old female with an incidentally found neuroendocrine tumor in the tail of the pancreas. The lesion caused dilatation of the pancreatic duct distally. This was clearly demonstrated on an MRI and the lesion is readily evident. The procedure is started by mobilization of the colon. The patient has been placed in a modified right lateral decubitus position and a clockwise technique is used. The colon is mobilized first to aid on the retraction of the organs by gravity. The spleen is exposed. The dissection is carried from cauda to cephala. Endocyanin green also facilitates identification of the pancreas from the surrounding fat. The lesser sac is entered at its most lateral portion and the short gastric vessels are ligated and divided from cauda to cephalid. Posterior gastric attachments to the pancreas are divided. The mobilization of the colon and stomach, aided by gravity, allowed a very good access and exposure to the area of the pancreas. The dissection is continued, freeing the inferior edge of the pancreas. A plane is developed behind the pancreas and using a finger, the pancreas is surrounded in 360 degrees. A tape is passed for pancreas traction towards the left, which will aid on continuing the dissection medially towards the area of the neck of the pancreas. The gastrocolic momentum and posterior attachments are further divided. Endocyanin green is again used. Superior serosal attachments of the pancreas are divided. The superior mesenteric vein is identified with the ultrasound. A window is created below the inferior edge of the pancreas at the level of the superior mesenteric portal vein trunk. A finger is again used to surround the pancreas in 360 degrees. A penrose is passed and the neck of the pancreas will be retracted superiorly to allow passage of a stapler. A progressive stepwise compression technique is used with staple line reinforcement. The pancreas is transected and ligated. Indocyanin green is again used to identify the edge of the pancreas, which facilitates the dissection towards the vessels of the celiac trunk. An arterial vessel, likely the hepatic artery, is first identified. Small bites are taken to avoid injuring these vessels. The celiac trunk is exposed as it is the origin of the splenic artery. The splenic artery is surrounded at 360 degrees and a bulldog is placed. Ultrasound confirms this is the splenic artery. The artery is stapled and divided. The splenic vein is surrounded, ligated and divided in similar manner. Following a clockwise technique, the pancreas is retracted anteriorly and laterally Superior attachments are ligated and divided. The spleen is then mobilized by dividing first its posterior and lateral attachments and then 
its superior attachments to the undersurface of the diaphragm. Once free, the specimen is placed in an endoscopic retrieval bag and removed from the abdominal cavity. Hi, uh, my name is Andrea Pietrabissa, and I'm the president of the European Association for Endoscopic Surgery. So in the first place, I would like to thank uh, Professor Hur and Professor Kim for this kind of invitation, the strength, the uh, relationship between EAS and KE cells. We are all living very difficult times and uh, both associations are, are showing how good uh, they have been in uh, uh, facing this new challenge by organizing virtual meeting uh, like this. And I know what it takes uh, to do that, and uh, we are all looking forward for uh, the near future when we'll be able to shake our hands again and meet again in person. So in the meantime, uh, let me uh, address uh, today's uh, short talk, which is about the um, uh, hand-sewn robotic anastomosis for uh, esophageal cancer in the Ivor Lewis procedure. Let me share my screen with you and see uh okay and uh this is it okay i have uh, nothing to disclose and uh, you can take pictures or videos of my presentation if you wish uh so the the topic again is the uh, anastomotic technique uh, uh during the reconstruction phase after an is esophagectomies and as you all know uh, various techniques have been reported from uh, uh, laparoscopic thoracoscopic to laparoscopic uh, thoracoscopic and robotic anastomosis totally robotic and uh, a, a number of uh, mix up of these uh, available techniques now the main issue the main technical issue here here is how you perform your anastomosis because the leaking rate and the, the deadly consequences of that are related obviously to the technique of anastomosis and if you look at the available literature uh, this doesn't really seem to help um, this is just an overview of some of the paper uh, addressing the issue on, uh, of how to perform the anastomosis and uh, that varies from uh, um, um, staple, uh, circular staple, linear staple, side to side, uh, end to end, end to side and uh, end zone through a thoracotomy, uh, totally thoracoscopic or totally robotic transiatal. But the anastomotic leak rate uh, varies uh, very widely from 5 to 40 percent and uh, if you try to correlate in meta-analysis the uh, leak rate with the anastomotic te technique there seems to be no connections between the two so you cannot associate one type of anastomosis to the result and uh, if you read these papers carefully every technique appears to be the right choice for the authors which are promoting this technique over others and even in high volume centers the average leak rate still remains in the in the range of 10 percent and that correlates with very long hospital stay when a leak occurs and occasionally with a, a fatal outcome so uh, um, uh, our choice in, in my institution is to perform a hand-sewn hand uh, anastomosis using the robot and the reason for using the robot is that you can uh, adjust the tension and have the better the best uh, possible articulation of the needle as you go through the tissues uh, creating a, a minimum minimum impact on uh, tissue damage there's no standardized technique for a robotic end zone anastomosis. And uh, if you look at the available literature, again, the results are biased by a number of variables. Uh, so many different ways to create what will be labeled as the same esophagogastric anastomosis, but in practice, it is not the same thing. And this is how we do it. Uh, now, the first step is to transect the proximal esophagus and that is done with the linear stapler at reasonable distance from the visible cancer uh, that would be for most cases of of uh, distal third uh, esophageal tumor at the level of the articles vein and uh, we would leave uh, four or five centimeters of proximal esophageal stamp available 
for the following anastomosis. Then we pull through uh, the gastric conduit. And um, uh, another uh, trick we use is to make the conduit as narrow as possible. Um, I would say less than four centimeters in, in diameter. And these allow for a better vascularization. Obviously, the, the, the smaller the gastric conduit, the, the less vascular supply will be needed. Um, and uh, then once we are in the chest, we section the gastric conduit in, in a tailored fashion, uh, varying from one patient to another. Uh, usually it is possible uh, to completely remove the fundus of the stomach. Uh, and that is good for two reasons. Uh, the fundus doesn't seem to be the best vascularized uh, part of the stomach. And also the the thickness of the uh, fundus is, is slim. And so uh, if we use instead the, uh, uh, the body of the stomach for the anastomosis, that compares to the thickness of the esophagus and, and makes this anastomosis more equal on both sides. Um, and also, uh, if you make just the, the, the right uh, dimension of the gastric conduit uh, without uh, excessive length, the, the, you reduce the risk of kinking above the diaphragm that sometimes can cause uh, vascular impairment. Uh, the specimen is then removed through a mini toracotomy, uh, the size of which depends on the size of the tumor, but usually can be kept to a minimum of few centimeters. And then we approximate the two staple lines without uh, any tension. Then the anastomosis is done, and I'm gonna show you a video uh, very, very shortly. And um, um, the uh, anastomosis is done uh, with uh, three or four layers. Now the first layer, the most important uh, one, um, approximates the two staples lines on the esophageal and gastric conduit part. So we approximate with barbed suture, uh, a 3-0 um, uh, running suture, we approximate the two staples lines. Then we make a cut and we approximate the uh, mucosa of the posterior wall then of the anterior wall. And finally, if needed, we can uh, add some uh, omentoplasty or, or um, uh, cover the anastomosis with the pleural patch. And uh, this is uh, the uh, anastomosis as it is done. So the first layer, again, we use 3O barbed suture uh, and we approximate the two staple lines. Uh, this will significantly uh, uh, make uh, this uh, anastomosis tension free and uh, the risk of a posterior leak, uh, which is where uh, usually the leaks tends to occur, is minimized. Then we open the, uh, uh, the wall of the esophagus and uh, the wall of the stomach um, uh, and, uh, and then we uh, run uh, the second running suture, again with the same barbed um, type of thread. Uh, using a barbed um, a suture type, uh, I think is a great advantage because you don't have to uh, worry about the tension or the um, suture line uh, because that, that is uh, uh, guaranteed by um, the, uh, uh, your pulling the, the thread as you go through uh, and the barbed suture, suture will, will stay uh, your tension uh, the way you decide. So this is the uh, internal uh, posterior layer of our anastomosis, which is then uh, followed by, uh, okay, so this is the NG tube. The NG, NG tube is passed by the anesthetist uh, now from the esophagus to the gastric conduit. Uh, the reason of the gastric tube is to avoid any uh, um, uh, extra inflation of the gastric conduit that will pose some extra tension on the anastomotic line uh, for the first couple of days after surgery. We usually uh, give uh, methylene blue uh, to the patient on the third postoperative day uh, to make sure there are no leaks. And then we start feeding the patient with uh, uh, a, a fluid uh, diet from the third post-op day. Now, since we've been using this technique, uh, which is a, a couple of years from now, uh, we haven't seen uh, any more uh, anastomotic leak, which is um, somehow unusual because in our experience that would range uh, uh, roughly between uh, 10 and 15% of cases. So we are very pleased 
uh, with the new technique. Uh, let me also add that uh, the uh, uh, drainages we put at the end of this procedure is, is just one actually. We don't put any drainage for the air. We just put a posterior uh, Jackson prop type uh, drainage, uh, which is advanced transabdominally in the uh, posterior aspect of the esophageal anastomosis, which is usually where uh, a potential leak is likely to happen. Now, this is how the anastomosis uh, looks like, um, and then uh, we, we might add some uh, omentoplasty if needed, or some uh, uh, pleural patch to enforce this uh, anastomosis. So I've run out of, uh, of my time, uh, so let me go back to the full view. Uh, just to say, well, I'm not showing any, any numbers. Uh, our experience is somehow preliminary, uh, but as many other authors, I'm uh, passionate with the type of nasomosis we come up with. And uh, uh, in, uh, I think that uh, has the, um, uh, the background uh, to provide some advantage to those surgeons who are dealing with this uh, difficult and sometimes uh, challenging procedure which is the uh, minimal invasive Ivo Lewis. Thank you very much for your attention and have a nice day. One, two, three. Okay, now it's time for the online discussion. We have two speakers online. The first uh, speaker is uh, Takeyoshi Akiyoshi from Japan, and uh, the Horatio Aspon from US is online now. So I have uh, two questions about, I will give two questions for each uh, speaker. The first, I will ask the Horatio first. So we saw your video very, it was very impressive. So how, I'd like to ask you, what is the learning curve? How many cases are needed to do a laparoscopic uh, pancreatic surgery? Thank you, Professor uh, Yun Suk Lee. I first want to thank the organizers of Case Health Caros um, for the invitation and the honor to present. Um, <clears throat> the learning curve for pancreatic surgery is very variable depending where do you start and also what procedures do you want to tackle. I would have to say that before you start doing pancreatic surgery, you need to make sure you understand what's entailed and you commit yourself to try to do as far as what you decided you want to do. If you're going to do just left-sided pancreatectomies, it's a totally different learning curve than if you decide to go ahead and do a pancreatic duodenectomy. Then uh, I'm going to concentrate on the pancreatic duodenectomy in the interest of time. It does take a significant amount of time to learn. However, if you really want to do it, today there are many centers that are doing it well, and you first need to get acquainted, understand what's going on, um, what needs to be done to learn, and then go little by little. Um, I, I would have to say that the immediate learning curve is around 30 cases, but really to develop the technique well and to feel very comfortable, it may take 50 or 60 cases then it's one of the most complex procedures in the abdomen, as we all know, and one should not take it lightly. Having said that, once you learn, if you're committed, it is incredibly satisfying to be able to do things and see things that you don't see at an open surgery. Okay, I, I totally agree with, with you that the, the pancreatic surgery is one of the most complicated the surgery. And the second question is, during the minimally invasive surgery for pancreatic cancer, what is the most challenging part? Well, um, I, I, it depends. The, the traditional most challenging part is the pancreatic or jejunostomy, the ductal mucosa anastomosis. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, though, if you really dedicate yourself to learn how to suture and you mm -hmm. go in, in a very structured way, and this is not the time to tell you how to, but if you're in a very structured well, after a while, that becomes the very satisfying part. And in fact, today and now for several years, I feel I can do a much better ductal mucosa anastomosis laparoscopically than I can do it open. Okay. Then 
once you get to that learning curve, the most challenging part is the dissection of the uncinate process from the vein when you have received neoadjuvant therapy, including IRE or radiation. But again, it depends what part of the learning curve you are. Initially, the ductal mucosa anastomosis. Later, when you master that, that's a sta sta a stable. You don't get into bleeding. Then the other part becomes the most difficult. Okay, thank you. And I have a very simple uh, question to Dr. Ashoka because we are beyond the schedule. Uh, yes. Usually, the, the patient who have lateral pelvic lymph node enlarged, we do a preoperative chemo radiation. So, what is the later metastatic lymph node after the chemo radiation for rectal cancer? Yes, uh, thank you for uh, Professor Lee. So, uh, in my institution, so we perform lateral lymph node dissection only for patients with enlarged lateral lymph node. It's about 30% of patients who are treated by CRT. And among those patients uh, who underwent lateral lymph node dissection, so the uh, percentage of lateral lymph node metastasis is uh, about 30%. Oh, 30. So totally, yeah, 30%. Okay. So totally only uh, less than 10% of the patients who are treated by CRT had mm -hmm. a finally pathological lateral lymph node metastasis. I have one more question from the audience that how about the urinary function after surgery and about the, the, the audience as the clinical pathway about after the lateral pelvic lymph node dissection? Yeah, thank you. So, yes, it's a very important uh, question. So, unfortunately, I have no uh, so accurate and detailed uh, urinary function data So by questionnaire. So, but uh, actually, so the, I think the percentage of uh, urinary dysfunction after lateral lymph node dissection is higher than TME alone. So okay. that's why we have to, uh, so we have to reduce the number of lateral lymph node dissection. So, okay. yeah. So, but when we perform, uh, so unilateral lateral lymph node dissection, and uh, so when we divide the uh, only inferior vesicle vessels, the urinary dysfunction is only temporary and it's not so severe. And mm -hmm. so we usually remove the urinary catheter uh, after five uh, postoperative days. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for joining this conference. Thank you, Horacio, and thank you, Takazi. Thank you. I, I hope stay safe and see you in the yeah. near future, face-to-face, -face each other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Yeah.